Well, I'd like to welcome you all here to another class from the BYU Library Family History Center. We are going to be talking about handwriting. And there's one thing that you run into if you do any kind of genealogy, even if you're doing some really basic genealogy, like getting into the 1950 U.S. Census, you're going to find that uh, handwriting is immediately one of the challenges that you're going to face because uh, all of the entries are in handwriting. You ha do have a what I might call a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Uh, we have some very sophisticated handwriting recognition programs that are being used by Family Search and Ancestry and other large online websites to index large numbers of records. And in fact, the 1950 census was digitized. Then uh, it was given to Ancestry, and Ancestry ran their handwriting recognition program, and it took about six hours to do the whole index of the 1950 census. Then Family Search volunteers spent a couple of months checking the the accuracy, and most of us who did some checking found out that the accuracy was, I would, I would put it at an extremely high level. It's claimed that it's better than the people who were looking at handwriting previously as, as far as accuracy. So there are possibilities in the future that uh, handwriting will not be a problem, but presently there's billions and billions of records across the world that are still completely handwritten, and it is one of the major issues. So we'll move on and some of the history so that we can understand the context of what we're dealing with here. Uh, the earliest known form of handwriting is Sumerian pictographic system found on clay tablets. This is around 3200 BC, and it was eventually modified and called cuneiform. Some of the recent discoveries to, and that are coming out in the news in the last year or so seem to indicate that there may be older writing systems even. So I think that's still kind of a an area of investigation for archaeologists and and uh, people who are interested in that in the history of the of the ancient world. Here's just an up up close view of what uh, cuneiform looks like. You can imagine the effort that it took for the first people who were able to begin to translate this into something that made sense. And it was done primarily because they encountered clay tablets like this that were inventories of objects of like things like sheep and cows and oxen, things like that. And so they were able to begin the process of decoding this particular uh, form of handwriting. You might be interested, just as a side note, as to why I would be talking about this. And one of the couple of things is that I got a master's degree in linguistics, and my minor was in the history of the English language. And on top of that, I have spent many, 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 many years uh, reading all of these different documents going back. So... The earliest genealogical records, if you're interested, are from China, and they date back to 1500 BC. And the oldest traceable family tree is the Kang clan, and its lineage has over 5,200 years and more than 80 generations of genealogy. That's the good news. That's a lot of information, a lot of people, but these are strictly pedigrees that go back that show the family going back. So a lot of this, the what we would call collateral information 
there's probably some, but not uh, not to the extent of a full blown family tree type type organization. European based genealogical records go back to the 1500s. Now, think about this, and if you if you have something interesting, if you have a family tree online, um, if you're on the Family Search family tree, for example, or uh, something like that you might just click back and see how far your particular lines go back in time and uh, compare that to some of the things that I'm going to talk about during this presentation. Uh, if your, your um, lines go back before the 1500s for some reason, you might just think about that in light of the information that I'm going to have. And I'll make uh, a number of comments about that because it's it's extremely important to understand that there are limitations and there are times when people are copying, simply copying names down from records without actually seeing any kind of original document and not knowing if the information that was gathered is accurate or is simply something that was made up. I think it goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, and that is that all European documents were handwritten before the publication of the Gutenberg Bible in 1377. This is a page, this is actually the first page, the, the, the I could, would call this a preface because it's a letter dedicating and, and explaining the, the Bible printing, and it is, uh, that's what it looks like. So, the question you, I would have is, uh, and I will come back to this, as to how this can you be? Can it be read? And can you read it? So, knowing that there are, and this number is exact, and I am always skeptical of exact numbers, but uh, there's the source down there where I got this information, and perhaps it's correct. Uh, I haven't been out and counted them, so I can't say that, the, that it isn't correct. But it says that there are 293 writing systems worldwide, according to the current state of research, as of January 2022. And I have seen a lot of those, and some of them I have not any clue as to how I would start to understand or or uh, transcribe that without a tremendous spending a tremendous amount of time learning. So no matter where your ancestors came from, and it doesn't matter in what part of the world, it doesn't matter whether you go back in the United States back to for to the 1600s, or if you go back in well not to the United States but America before the United States in, in uh, the 1600s or any other part of the world, wherever people are moving from one place to another, you're going to end up trying to read old handwriting. This is the Gothic alphabet, and it was a ninth century alph alphabet, and uh, it was used to translate the Bible and other religious works into Moravian, in the great Moravia region that's in Eastern Europe. And here's a little closer look at that. Once again, in a lot of cases, unless you have some sort of key, something that uh, a translation of it, or a, uh, in the case of one of the most famous translations, that is of Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, when Champon Lyon translated the hieroglyphics, for the first time in France, and how that happened, and only way the only way it could have happened was that during the Napoleon's conquest of the world, that they discovered what's called the Rosetta Stone that had three different languages, and and one of those was one that Champollion and others could read, and so they were able to translate the the hieroglyphics. So. And this is a really important issue, original research. And I'm differentiating that from copying from a book. And when I, when I say copying from a book, what I mean is not that I'm copying from a book like a, a pedigree book or a, a 
surname book or a descendancy book or whatever. In other words, a book written about someone's life and, and of course, or someone's family. Of course, that information may or may not be correct. It may be, it's only as good as the person who wrote the book. And so if the information in that book is is not correct. My great-grandmother had a, a book of the Jarvis and the Freeze families, which are my ancestors. And the common thing about it is by in, in going through the book is that it's not reliable to the extent that you would accept everything as being correct. There's a lot of good pictures in it, uh, photographs and things like that. And it's a valuable, it's a valuable reference, but it's one that gets you a little bit frustrated if you start to look at other records and realize that that much of the information was uh, secondhand, kind of hearsay, if you use that term that we did in the legal world. And so basically, it's it's like a good suggestion, but it's not the end of the job. And so when I say people are copying out of a book, what that means is that you just pick it up and say, oh, here's my whole genealogy, or here's my my uh, royal line and so i'm related to this guy and so i'm this to copy this out and put it in my family tree well your your chances of being correct in those kinds of situations are uh, approach zero especially the further back you go one thing that is is just kind of a basic problem uh, let's not call it a problem let's call it challenge of genealogical research is that Every time you get back to about 1500 AD, you're going to have to start learning a new handwriting system and a new language. And the further back you go in time, you're going to get new language and you're going to get new handwriting systems. Because there's one thing that's important that um, I learned in studying linguistics was that language changes, language changes over time. And the only reason that languages don't change more quickly now than they did in the past was because we have a society that preserves not only the language, but also the, the sound of the language. So we can listen to recordings that go back uh, to the early 20th century and, and hear the way the people spoke. But if you begin to, if you actually do that and go back and listen, you'll begin to hear a lot of words and a lot of uh, the way the speech patterns work that have already changed considerably, that we don't speak the same way. But in, in societies that were, were largely illiterate and where people did not have access to any recordings at all, nothing, audio recording at all, language had a tendency to change fairly rapidly over what would be called a hundred years or so. And so this is important to understand from this from the genealogical research standpoint is that um, you're going to be faced with this kind of challenge as you go back in time. So we're back to this uh, first page of the um, Gutenberg Bible, and it's specifically the epistle or or letter of St. Jerome de Paulinus from the university. This is the University of Texas copy of the Gutenberg Bible. And it was published back in the 1450s. They don't have really specific access um, in a lot of cases for the Gutenberg Bibles. They only know that they came from the 1450s. They do not know the exact date of publication. So, if you had this, and who had this as the first introductory statement, can you read it? Do you know what language it's in? Is it in English? Would it be, it's in German. Gutenberg was German. The answer to that is no, it's in Latin. And uh, so there's lots of, uh, what are the little marks over the, the words? And what are the... You know, it looks pretty much all the same. Okay, so maybe you can read Latin, great. That is uh, uh, going to be a big step if you took Latin in high school. I don't know if I haven't heard anybody taking Latin lately. In my day, 
some places, some high schools did offer uh, courses in Latin as well as French and Spanish and German. And so this is the kind of thing that you're going to face. And this is 1450s. This is before 1500. But uh, this was the, the status of what you're going to, kind of documents that you're going to see. So the handwriting itself began in the 10th century. And that's where a lot of, of even before that, actually, but uh, beginning in about that time, different kinds of handwriting, different scripts that you would be referred to the, the way that it's being written. And so there were two different scripts in China, the small script and, uh, and a lot of others. And there's a short little explanation of that here on the screen. If you're doing any kind of research into Chinese genealogy will be become something you need to know very, that's very important to know that. And learning all of these characters is the process of learning Chinese. So it's uh, quite complex. Languages themselves, one of the, you hear, when you hear about language and people talk about languages, uh, sometimes they'll say, oh, well, it's a lot easier to learn Spanish than it is to learn English. Well, I mean, it, to learn German or to learn, oh, let's give you a hard one, uh, Armenian or Russian. Well, the difficulty of learning a language is based on the individual and the individual's original language, their native language. Because if the languages that you're trying to learn are related to each other, like Spanish and French and, and uh, Romanian and all of the, and, uh, the Romance languages, for example, and the Germanic languages like German and and uh, some of the Norwegian languages and things like that are that are related to each other. It's easier to move within your language family, but it can be an almost insurmountable a difficulty to move between two completely different and completely unrelated languages. I spent a couple of years in graduate school learning how to translate Shoshone, which is an American Indian language. And I can tell you very bluntly that there are no words that are the same in either of the of English and Shoshone, and there are no ways that they have the same concepts or, or underlying ideas. The way that the language works is entirely foreign. There are no, no comparisons. And to translate it into English was basically giving a estimation of what the Shoshone said in English and what the English would have said in Shoshone. And that was something that uh, for me was uh, kind of an awakening, a time when it was when I was beginning to understand that there were concepts that were available in other languages, thought patterns and concepts that did not even have a correspondence in English and that there was no English equivalent. So this is, uh, it, it can be a, a great challenge. So here's a little bit of a closer look at some of those Chinese characters. So just for interest's sake, and now we're getting into European and, and uh, Western Asian type languages. And it's interesting that the earliest Cyrillic texts go back to using this form of language of transcription, the script of the language uh, in Bulgaria uh, by Preslov. Hmm. Preslov is known for a treaty that ended the uh, Holy Roman Empire, by the way. And Krepsha, it's called the Krepsha inscription, and it's from 921 and dating back to 931. Now, when you start seeing the, the numbers, in other words, why would I be discussing this? And what is it applicability does it have to uh, application to genealogical research? Well, you're starting to see some dates here that as far as research in 
in genealogical in the genealogical sense are are uh, limits. They're they're limiting the the rea the reality of doing research past these periods of time. Because the, the when you get past these periods of time, you find that uh, the language systems were were entirely different, and that the way that the language was written, if there was a way that the language was written, if there was a written language from that particular area, it was very different. And going back in that time period is is very important to to understand that you're. You know, when somebody comes to me and says, oh, my genealogy goes back to Charlemagne, well, I would just kind of check to see how far back in time Charlemagne lived and to see where he lived and and to see whether or not anything that he had that was written about him at the time, any records from his time, actually are something that you could read or could you could verify that, that it was correct. So... This is kind of the the idea here with reading handwriting. And by the way, I thought it was interesting in seeing this list of all the languages around uh, that are possible around the world and historically that were written with the Cyrillic alphabet. So there's a lot of he languages here that uh, if your ancestors appear anywhere on this uh, list of places, then you can begin to understand that that's where uh, with the kinds of things, that the type of, of uh, records that you're going to find, if there are any records, will be in this particular language script. Now, this is another one that uh, you may recognize this if you have uh, some history in, in Scandinavia and perhaps England and some other places. And that is... Uh, what you would immediately identify this and you'd say well those are runes and the answer is well yes but that's not exactly what they are these are called this particular form here is called medieval futhork and the futhork was developed in the 13th century so that's 1200 and this basically is a it was became a a very popular method of recording information because each letter uh, corresponded to what we call a phoneme a phoneme is an, is a distinctive sound in the language and so what had happened is is you is when you read this uh, you actually are are reproducing the sounds that were made at the time in other words these each one of those characters there represents a certain sound and words are made up of sounds and so each word in the language could have is represented by this and that was it's kind of an innovation and it was a way that the language uh, could be represented today we have languages that uh, roughly correspond to the characters that are used English is not one of them. Um, there are some words that the letters that you learn when you're uh, going to school and learning how to read and things like that, that those letters do have rough rough estimates of what the sounds like in English and when you're speaking English. But anyone who speaks English the way we do here in Utah or someplace around will certainly understand that it's uh, only very roughly that the, any any of the English characters, the Roman alphabet that we use in England in English today, has any correspondence to the actual sounds. Uh, there's a greater correspondence between the sounds and the letters in a language like Spanish and, and Italian, and uh, from that reason alone, they are viewed as languages that are easier to learn than some other language that doesn't have a close correspondence between the characters and the actual spoken language. So here's a close-up of the futhark, or runes. So if your lines of your family tree go back to the 13th century, that's 1200, and you have in Europe, in Northern Europe and, and that area, 
and you have uh, your family tree on family search or wherever it is and you go back click 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 and suddenly you're into 1250 or 1210 or something like that the records that you're referring to there are were written in this and so the question i have is you can you assume that the people who entered the information into the family tree have read this stuff looked it up and found the records and and entered the information from the rooms if so then that's great but i would simply be around asking that question if uh, if whoever it is where did they get the information and did they have the expertise to uh, translate this and how much of what they got out of the manuscripts was accurate and had any relative a relationship to in any actual pedigrees and this is another interesting thing when you first look at this you see elder futhark you think this picture is a picture of elder futhark well it isn't it's a picture of sophus bugay and sophus was a a person who translated this and it it and you read this, and I think it's important kind of to understand things like this, because they're, this is, and when I give these kinds of examples in my presentations and my, when I do a class like this, this is an example. This isn't a piece of information that may or may not be helpful to you. In other words, it may not relate to you and your particular ancestral lines, and it may not be a crucial something that you need to learn. But I'm using it as an example, and the example in this particular case is that the runic alphabets, the elder Futhark is the oldest form, and that was used from the 1st to the 8th centuries. And then there's a, a form in the language has changed, the, the, the alphabets changed because they were representatives of the sound system of what we would call phoneme changes, and they the languages themselves changed, so the characters changed because the language, the, the spoken language was changing. And uh, it developed at the end of the 8th century and became the standard after years 750 to 800. And after the use of runes declined, as languages changed even more, and as other writing systems were introduced, such as the Roman writing system that is the basis for what we have today in uh, in English. And actually, the elder Futhark from the first to the eighth century didn't have no one knew how to read it anymore. So there were no uh, there was nobody in the world who knew how to read the runes from before the eighth century, 700s. It was pretty hard to do any genealogy past 700 if nobody could read the handwriting. And then it was deciphered by this guy in 1865. So what's going to happen is you go back in time and look at language specifically and at the history of the handwriting in conjunction with the history of the spoken language is that you will run into the same kind of thing in almost every case at some point going back in the in the past at some point in time no one could read the language and it's only been through scholars who have in a sense gone back and done historical studies to, to be able to crack the language and there are still a number of texts out there that are unreadable and uh, in fact i've seen news that they've discovered another one that's unreadable and they have no idea what it says and they have no idea who spoke it because they don't, uh, they can guess because of the archaeological placement where it was found, but they don't really know what sound like what the language was. So from the fourth to the eighth centuries, and you, it was overlap, and whether it was used in the particular country or area, like in uh, the Scandinavian countries or in other parts of the of Europe uh, depended on the particular culture and the language that was spoken. But from the 4th to the 8th centuries, this is the 
basic language. And if you know anything about uh, Ireland, you'll know that the oldest book in Ireland is the Book of Kells, and it's in a script that's a variety of this unctual script. And it was used up until the 1900s in, in Ireland. So uh, this is something, if you're doing Irish research, you may run into rather quickly in going back in time. It's difficult because this, by the way, this is all in Latin again. And it's also difficult because it, uh, there's no, nothing telling me where sentences begin and stop or no, there's no way to, to know. It just sort of runs in a, in a kind of a stream. And so you can get to a little, it's a little bit difficult to translate. I spent a couple of years uh, taking biblical Hebrew and translating that was uh, one of the major challenges. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, it was harder to translate biblical Hebrew. Just the only good thing about it, of course, is we had various English translations, but the idea here was to, to try to translate it without looking at the English translations and see what you could come up with. And uh, so that was, and that was actually harder from my standpoint than learning Shoshone. Because Shoshone, you just started out at that spot zero, but with biblical Hebrew, you had uh, some very complex uh, texts to begin with. And so um, basically what had happened is that there were some translations of Shoshone. And so there was, uh, let's say, a beginning of a Shoshone English dictionary. But as over time, over the years that I worked uh, in the anthropology department at the University of Utah on that project, uh, we developed an English Shoshone, Shoshone English dictionary. That was the whole purpose of the project. And then that was published. So that was the type of activity. Okay, so... Basically, this is what it looks like up close. And it's possible to read this. It takes a tremendous amount of effort and time, first of all, to learn enough Latin to read what it says. And then when you get that, get used to the, to the uh, script to the point where uh, reading it becomes possible. And so time over time, and we're moving on to the 9th and 13th century. And this, once again, hits that magic 1,200-year, uh, what I would call barrier to, uh, to research. And this is uh, what's called Carolinian or Carolingian, depending on how you pronounce it. And it was one used very commonly. And this is, if you go back in time and look at manuscripts, you'll find uh, this this uh, particular uh, script was being used uh, fairly, fairly uniformly across Europe. And so it's in a lot of different language, languages. But uh, because we're, as genealogists, looking for specific information, that meaning information about ancestry, the, the actual texts that we could look at and uh, where we would focus on finding that information is primarily from the church, uh, in the case of Europe, from the Catholic and the, and the Lutheran churches, and then the Russian, the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox churches, and as later as other churches. But the information in a lot of that case, and particularly in the Roman Catholic Church, would be in is almost always in Latin. If it's not all in Latin, at least a lot of the terms are in Latin. And so this is the the not only the uh, script barrier, it's also the language barrier when you get back to the 1200s. So now we're moving forward in time, and uh, this is one kind of, of variation of the language that was used in the 12th to the 16th century. Now, the 16th century is 1500s, and that is, uh, uh, for most of Europe, that is the beginning of the time when there were no records of anyone who was 
uh, not a nobleman, not a not a something related to the monarchy or the church. The ordinary people simply do not appear in a lot of the in any of the records for the most part, in any records that beginning around the 1500, 1550 mark. And that's as a kind of a rough, uh, been a rough estimate of the time frame that it was realistic to do genealogical research. And the other question is, how much of it has already been done and how much research has already been done? Well, it's almost virtually complete. Any information about the research of people uh, back before in the old manuscripts of all of they've all been transcribed or or are available so the the key thing here is that I've been talking about the, uh, the availability of of getting these records but uh, of goodly share if not nearly all of these records have been translated then we get into the secondary part of of genealogy and that is how do you know which where these language where these documents are all being kept and do you have the time to check to see that what they said and the translations are correct? And sometimes you'll find conflicting, diametrically opposed of conflicting translations. So you need to understand that. This is a little part on the bottom. It is part of this uh, called Gothic bookhand that is the predecessor of what we call black letter. The black letter is the common script you'll find in beginning around the early 1900s going back into the 1800s and before in germany uh, if you're going to do german research this is uh, what you will the script you will likely find uh, in the handwriting and then from the 14th century that's the 13th century then I mean, the 1300s and 1400s and the 1500s, and there were just all sorts of systems. There were lots of different handwriting. This is this is kind of a copy of of uh, some of the the handwriting styles and and records, and those long strings of letters that you see there are are actually the way that the, the text was written. Uh, there's not even divisions among the words, and they just have everything strung together. And so it was just copied with one long string of, string of words. And so you can see how there could be some disputes over the, the meaning, especially if it was some kind of uh, de determining the relationships of two parties, for example. So then... Cursive, uh, and just to understand the, the terminology that I've been using, cursive is any style of penmanship in which the characters are jo written joined in a flowing manner. Now, they're only joined in certain circumstances, and, and uh, not all the letters might be joined, but only some of the letters might be joined. And so when you look at it, it may not make any sense in this particular right here is obviously uh, old it's an old roman cursive but it's uh, the latin predecessor so this also is in latin and yes it could be read if you learned how to read those particular characters this one's a little bit of a surprise now if you stare at this for a few minutes if you were to come back to this video on uh, youtube and stop it here uh, you could look at this and this is gothic cursive and it was used from the 13th to the 15th century so we're up to the 1400s in this particular one and uh, this is also one that was used in the center part of europe like in germany and the, they're not germany as a country did not exist but the german speaking people where german spoke was the language was spoken then this type of script was common and uh, if you look at this carefully you'll see that it's actually written in english so i just thought i'd throw that in so here's actually english cursive from the 1400s this is where you're getting into this kind of a cursive language in this particular script here 
And because it's written in English and perhaps scattered with uh, terms in in, uh, in Latin or some very archaic terms that you wouldn't even know the meaning of, but this is uh, a good example of uh, of a language of what the language would look like in records that you're likely to find if you keep going back in time. And after looking at this for a a period of time, and I'll talk about that in just a minute, this is readable. I can I can read a lot of this without even spending any time but basically it takes it would take time to to get the whole meaning out of this particular transcription this, this part now we move into the 16th and 17th centuries in 15 and 1600s and this is what you're likely to find the probably as you go back in time this may be the first time that the text that you're running into doing research becomes a challenge becomes something that you've got to say, oh, wait a minute, this is a will, and I'm supposed to read this will, and uh, or this might be the clue to who this, this person really was, or is this really our ancestor, and all the other questions you might be asking. And this is called secretary hand, and it was used throughout Europe. It, was, it became really the first real popular what you would call popular, and it didn't replace all of the other scripts out there. It just became a popular script. The reason, of course, is because of the uh, com commercialization that uh, international and in inter, inter city ca uh, commerce became very common, and you needed something that everybody could read. And so this was uh, one step towards getting a almost uh, almost completely readable language because this be, well, this actually was tr um, used in English German Welsh and Gaelic so there's uh, it was pretty well used and so this is what it looks like up close and this one is not in English italic script is the next step up and all of a sudden if you read handwriting today, it all of a sudden looks like handwriting that you could read. And it's called italic, and it was used in, in Italy for the Renaissance. Uh, obviously, this is in English, but it would have been in Italian or whatever language was being spoken in that particular area, and there were various languages being spoken in it in Italy at that time. Then... Uh, we get into the 18, late 1800s and early 1900s, and we get to what's called the Palmer Method. And those of us who are sort of old, is a term one term used, elderly is probably a, a euphemism. We went to school, and this was what we had up on the board that we were supposed to use and copy. And I can assure you that my handwriting didn't look anything at all like this. In fact, it was though it was virtually unreadable. And uh, it was only when I was in like uh, seventh and eighth grade in in uh, elementary school that I suddenly realized that my handwriting was illegible, and I I made a conscious effort to learn how to write because I wanted to communicate, and so I did learn how to write. Uh, much clearer today it's cop out because the children in a large part only if only left slightly more than half of the schools in the united states even teach hand uh, handwriting anymore but when it is taught there's newer systems and uh, the children who are still able to use handwriting or read handwritten letters and documents are are uh, few and far between my i had one of my own older grandchildren who i wanted to come and help me and was really anxious to come and help and sat him down in front of the computer and uh, went back in and said i said go through this and transcribe this and 
after about an hour, he came back and said, well, Grandpa, I don't, I can't read script. I can't read handwriting. So it's not uncommon and it's becoming a lost art in some, in, in some cases. Uh, there's been movements to try to implement more handwriting. Any relationship between what's here on this page and what my handwriting looks like today is uh, purely coincidental. So how do we learn it? How do we learn how to do handwriting? So we start with what's called an alphabet card. And you go online and you look up, you can go up and just say, give me a language cards and you'll get a whole bunch of language cards. Then you can start to match it to what you're looking at on the document. And uh, these are uh, cards that show the ABCD, the alphabet in whatever language and then shows uh, variations in the lettering. And there's just accumulated, there's thousands of these online. And you can then get that information and begin the process of deciphering and transcribing it. And transcribing it, of course, if it's in whatever language, is then a different, you're into a different situation because then after you've got it transcribed, You've got to translate it into the language that you speak. So this is uh, this is kind of the process. So here's what I suggest: when you see a new text like this, a script that you can't read, even if it's the 1950 census, or 1940 or 1930 census records or older, I would just stare at it look at the th and see what you recognize, what letters you recognize, and which words you recognize. And then as you look at it, don't spend more than half an hour or so. The more you spend on it, the less you'll get, less effect you'll get. Then put it away and then bring it out the next day or a couple of days later. But it'd be helpful if you did it on a daily basis and do it for the same time period. Each time, recognizing and writing down or however you want to rec record it uh, on a computer or whatever you're doing and taking more information and getting more information and finally getting words and sentences and start to look. And I can assure you that over a time period, and I've spent sometimes as long as two or three weeks before I could get most all the letters in a will, for example, and understand the context of the will. So keep looking for letters until you find a few words and also go out and look for transcriptions of the same kinds of documents. Let's say if it's a will or a parish register or whatever else, look online and see if someone has transcribed it. And they may have, and may that may be a constant, instant way to get into the language or the script. Remember, though, that there are these alphabet blocks out there, and they're, they're a great help and getting into the to the language and you may have to translate it at the same time because it may not make any sense until you know a few of the words and can begin to see what kind of document it is and the document could be in latin and it could be a mixture of latin uh, i find latin i find uh, spanish language parish registers uh, back, if I get back into the early 1800s, with a lot of Latin words sprinkled in. And so uh, it just depends on how and where you're doing your research. And go back and work with the alphabet cards and look for other alphabet cards. Look and see if you can keep, if there's some characters that you just can't, can't distinguish, it may be a different language, if, uh, another alphabet card may help. Sometimes it's just the individual handwriting is just not good. It's atrocious handwriting, and it's not readable even by people who were familiar with the script. So it's uh, it's sometimes sometimes I would say impossible to to decipher some of the words. So it could be worse. By the way, you keep working on it, it could get uh, much worse because uh, we could go to something like this. This, of course, is Arabic. And sometimes, uh, if you think about it here, it's like Cyrillic or Arabic or any of the non-Roman 
uh, alphabet languages that your uh, uh, your real real challenge is just comprehending what you're looking at when you start. So this is a challenge. And, and acknowledging that there's this challenge out there of both the language and the handwriting. So what is that? Well, the promise is that learning how to read old handwriting promises access to more records. And what does that mean? It means you're, you can extend your, your uh, uh, pedigrees you can verify the information that you've defined in uh, in other publications that may or may not be correctly copied or it may be intentionally not correct because that did happen and does happen in genealogical circles so you might want to just put on your pack and start up the hill and and learn all of the information that you can and uh, start learning to read this if you specialize, for example, in, in Swedish or in Norwegian or, or Danish or German, or, then learning the handwriting is just part of that process. So thanks for watching. <laughs>